So, welcome to the Overex Museum. My name is Darren. I'll be showing you through the building. And uh, we're going to talk about a lot of history in a very short amount of time. Uh, okay. So, this building here actually stands before the American Revolution, so it predates it by about 20 years. The bulk of our history here is based around the French and Indian War, uh, which would break out in 1754 here in North America. Uh, about two years later, what will happen is the Seven Years' War conflict will break out as well. Now, pretty much the conflict uh, or the fighting here in North America will go on for about nine years. But in the midst of that, the first two years of the war, you're going to run into a small problem. Uh, first of all, you have provincial regiments that are going to be raised up here to go out and fight against the French in parts of what will be uh, later turned into Ohio. Uh, parts of upstate New York, parts of western Pennsylvania, all the way up towards Canada, uh, Canada as well. Now, in addition to that, uh, these provincial soldiers, though they do most of the fighting throughout the year, both armies are going to go uh, inside for winter quarters because during the winter, it's really hard to maneuver military out of campaign. It's really hard to get supplies to them. It's also really hard to keep men alive throughout the winter on campaign. This is why they need to go into winter quarters. Now, with these provincial regiments, they tend to go home. Now. They also were losing a lot, so thankfully they had some help. Great Britain will send over about 20,000 British soldiers, especially once the Seven Years' War conflict breaks out. Now with that, they really run into a big problem, which is where are they going to house these 20,000 soldiers? There's not a very uh, large infrastructure for housing uh, very large amounts of people. For instance, uh, let's take a look at Trenton. Trenton, in the 18th century, has a population of around 900 people. With a population of 900 people, you don't need very, uh, very many large public buildings, much like the one that we're standing at now. And so, when it came down to housing these soldiers, when it came down to housing these soldiers uh, in the middle of the winter, they didn't have many places for them to go. So, outside of some of the public buildings that were left around, uh, what they really needed to do was to put them somewhere else. So they housed them in the homes of the people living here in North America. Now this was seen as against the law. This is technically illegal, but they really had no other choice. So to compensate, the colonial legislatures would compensate individual citizens for housing people throughout the winter. So imagine if you had five soldiers living in your home, uh, the government would say, hey, I will be able to pay you for housing these soldiers. However, the one problem they ran into is that they weren't uh, receiving a lot of financial help from Great Britain to begin with. So that means you probably wouldn't receive any of the money that they, um, uh, they had promised you, and if you did receive it, it wasn't what they promised you, which made a lot of people very unhappy. Um, but it really wasn't their fault. They didn't have. It always makes people unhappy. Yeah, even money. now. <laughs> <laughs> Having that lack of money really makes the people unhappy. However, what will happen is All William right. Pitt will rise to power as the new prime minister, a lot for about two hundred thousand pounds, and go to some of the coins spent, which allowed colonial legislatures like the ones here in New Jersey or colonial assemblies to be able to build places like this for the soldiers to be able to stay in. So New Jersey in particular builds five barracks, which is the one here in Trenton. You have one in Prince Amboy, one in Elizabeth, one in New Brunswick, and one in Burlington. Those other four no longer exist. This is the last one standing of all five. In fact, there's the last freestanding barracks left in all of North America from the French Navy War. So, come 1758, when they first finished the first iteration of this building, it will span from this wall here to that wall over there. Now, in the total of the building, there's only 20 rooms with a capacity of up to 300 soldiers. So, what we're going to do is take a look inside of one of the soldiers' apartments here to see how life would be if you were living here in the middle of the winter. All right? right. Also, if you have any questions while we're moving through the building, feel free to stop me and ask. I'm one that happy to clarify anything you're saying. I know I speak really fast. So That's all right. Feel free to That's stop right. me and slow me down. All right? So, got a lot of information to put out. The American Army is then given orders to move down to New York City. They drank a lot of wine? <laughs> they drank a lot of wine? Oh. Yeah. So these are uh, barrels that were donated to us. They are not absolutely 100% 18th century barrels, but they were donated to us from a, a, a local vineyard. Uh, but they would keep things like salted fish and so on inside of those barrels. So it's more like global storage. Right. right. Um, yeah, they salt everything down for keeping ready, did it back then, yeah. Or sometimes a ton of rum. <laughs> Alright, so here we are inside one of our soldiers' apartments. Inside of this room, you would be able to house anywhere between 12 to 18 soldiers. It's a lot of people. That's assuming that there would be two to three soldiers in a bed here, 
which is about four to six soldiers in a bunk. And there are three bunks in every room, so that's how we figure 12 to 18 soldiers multiplied by 20. That's around 280. You can squeeze 300 people in here if you really needed to. So this is fairly comfortable accommodations, given the fact that normally out on campaign, these soldiers would be sleeping in linen a frame tents, which don't tend to wick away moisture very well or to keep you warm. And with these same four to six soldiers, they would also uh, be sleeping on the ground with the only thing between them uh, and the ground being a very thin layer of straw. Now another thing that you have to keep into account is that they're all expected to cook for themselves and you only got one uniform for the year. So that means they're also not going to sleep in their uniform uh, for most parts of the year, just to preserve their uniform and to prevent unnecessary wear and tear. So imagine four to six fully grown men in the middle of the winter sharing a linen A-frame a tent, trying to brave the winter. Even with blankets, and even if they were sleeping in their clothes, they would probably die from exposure. So coming to places like this was absolutely great. And though we look at this today in a modern context and go, that is a lot of people in one room, this is actually really comfortable accommodations. They're in beds that aren't on the ground, they actually have somewhat of a matches, which we would call a bed ticking, uh, that would be filled with that straw that we mentioned before, so they're not sleeping directly on the straw. You also have a working uh, fireplace for them, which is solely just for heating the room. Any cooking that needed to be done would be done downstairs in a separate cooking heart. And so they have accommodations for that as well. Now I mentioned that getting supplies for this army would be a really hard thing to do. Because if you really think about it, if we have British soldiers coming here from Great Britain, well, if their home base, their establishment is going to Great Britain, that means it's going to take about three months for any supplies that they need to come across that small river that we call the Atlantic Ocean uh, to get here to supply the British Army. So this barracks, in particular, being stationed right outside of the town of Trenton, which is two miles in that direction in the 18th century. I know today we're in the heart of modern-day Trenton, but Trenton, as we know it today, does not exist just yet because of that state capitol building, which won't be completed until October of 1792. So they still have everything that they need being able to be supplied by the town of Trenton. Now each one of these other barracks as well, it's important to note that they're only about 20 miles apart from one another, which means about a day's march from each one of these barracks and they're all outside of very, uh, uh, very important towns. Most of them right along the Delaware River, which means they can get a lot of things imported into the uh, towns that they're in. And they're also far enough away from the fighting to where buildings like this wouldn't need very large fortifications. Hence why we only have a fence going around the building. However, accommodations like this would only be for uh, regular private soldiers all the way up to the rank of about sergeant. Now, that's non-commissioned officer range is sergeant. That's the top of that. Anything else beyond that in terms of commissioned officers, they wouldn't be expected to stay in places like this. So they're going to be uh, put or paying for their own housing in the town of Trenton. So they might rent a room in someone's house or they might rent a, a room in a tavern or what have you, but they're not going to stay in these sort of accommodations. And so, now we have a little bit of a conflict of interest because those guys that are in charge of everyone here, well, they're far enough away to where if there was any sort of emergency, they wouldn't be able to get here in enough time. But luckily, about six months after the initial completion of this half of the building, they build an officer's house for those officers to be able to stay in, which would be in 1759 when the first regiment of foot, which will bear these uniforms here, will actually occupy the building or utilize the building uh, at, for the very first time in its entirety. And so, here we like to portray the winter of 5960 because of the fact that we have the officer's house that would be completed in 1759. All right? Any questions so far? Oh, no. No, you're covering it pretty good. <laughs> so now we're going to step back out into the porch and we're actually going to make our way over to <coughs> the officer's house. Now it's important to note the uh, social differences between all people that are living here. So imagine all the things that we just spoke about here in this sort of level here, this is for regular blue collar working class citizens. Uh, a lot of them also have other trades to be able to feed their family. So that means they might also have, um, they might also be tailors or shoemakers or what have you, and they're using those trades when they're not going out and fighting. They might even be able to use them in the town of Trenton to make a little bit of extra money since you're not doing much throughout the next uh, three to four months that they would be staying here in this building for the winter. However, uh, this is pretty much regular sort of people. White collar citizens would be those people that are living inside the officer's house. Now most times when we think about offices of the 18th century, we tend to refer back to some of our knowledge that Hollywood has created, and we tend to right. think about them being these sort of pompous, oh, there is a spider on your uh, shirt there. So we tend to think about them as being these sort of pompous, uh, really entitled sort of people. And most of the times they're not these really rich, pompous, entitled people that we tend to think that they are. Um, they are actually 
probably only a little bit better off than a lot of these people here. Uh, and they're probably going to be second or third born sons in their affluent families. Meaning the first born son got the house, the horses, the grass, the carrots, all of the fun stuff. And the second and third born sons need to make a name for themselves to be able to get ahead in life. And so being part of the army was one of the best ways to easily move up through the social ladder. Uh, because let's say uh, one of those uh, one of those sons decides he wants to be, be part of the army. He starts out as an ensign, he moves up through the ranks. Eventually, let's say by the end of his career as being an officer, he winds up being a colonel, he has his own regiment, uh, and then he retires. He has two more sons. Those sons don't need to work nearly as hard as he did to make his way through the social ladder because now they get to start at the top, whereas his, their father started somewhere towards the bottom or in the middle. Right. And so that was the promise of being uh, part of the middle class sort of society that's still developing within the ancient century. So that's just a little bit of background on the officers before we go inside. So some of the stuff that you're going to see in there, it is going to be a little bit more elaborate than what these guys have because remember, this is bare necessities that you need to live. That is a house meant to house 6 to 12 officers, whereas one of these rooms, as we mentioned, houses 12 to 18 soldiers. So it's going to be a very large change in lifestyle between these rooms and that house of rooms. Okay? okay. There's two bedrooms on this first floor and there are another four bedrooms up on the second floor. Now if you notice, just looking at these two rooms here, just at a glance, this room here outfitted with two beds, that room there is outfitted with no beds. And at first glance you might go, we were lazy and we just didn't feel like moving the other bed. And that is not the case at all. Uh, what it is is that this building is actually very rarely filled to capacity. And that's what we're portraying here, which means some of the other rooms were more apt to be utilized uh, for being bedrooms. Where now we've created a space that is practical without wasting room. And so this space here is actually being used as an office. Someone like an adjutant could work out of there and now you're still using that space without wasting it. There's still very much a waste not sort of mentality within the uh, 18th century. Like for instance, uh, when you look at cows, they're going to use every part of the cow. So that, that means uh, from shoes, uh, the leather for shoes, to eating a nice steak and so on and so forth. They're going to utilize everything that they have. Now, to get down to the nitty gritty details of sort of personal effects, we're actually going to go into this room here and take a quick look around. Now here we have uh, this room depicted for two low ranking officers sharing the room. Now in here, it is way nicer than that room that we were just in before, that dark, dank sort of room, as opposed to this really nice kind of uh, vibrant room. Even with two men sharing this space, it's still a fairly nice sized room. It still feels way more comfortable than the room that we were in before. So now, uh, some of the personal things, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that this house comes partially furnished uh, upon their arrival. Meaning that the only things that will actually be here would be things like this chair, uh, even a desk like this one here, a filing cabinet, or what have you. So large pieces of furniture would be the things that would be around here. Everything else that's small, if you notice that this place looks very lived in, and everything that's small moves around with each one of these different uh, officers. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you kind of get that lived in sense, for instance, in your home, you might have a, a, a picture of you know, your, your grandparents, or you might have uh, a picture over here, this little trinket from that place you went that one time, uh, this other trinket from that place that you went that one time, or someone gave you a gift. And over time, you start accumulating these small things that represent who you are. They bring that stuff with them all the time, wherever they go, which is a lot of luggage, but there are a lot of all of that luggage. Part of that luggage is also going to be very practical things as well, such as a field bed. And so this field bed here is a rope tension style bed, and I'll get you a nice little show of that. So this rope tension style bed uh, has ropes going all the way around the frame here, holding a piece of linen canvas taut, uh, which is basically being held taut by the tension put on the ropes. Here. Great. Now, when you're making up a bed, most times you would need for a box spring to kind of give stability to your mattress, but that's what this rope tension system is for, so you don't need that. So last, you just put your uh, mattress on top of your bed first. This mattress is what we call the bed tick. We mentioned this in the other room. 
But this bed tank might be filled with goose down, which is a little bit uh, warmer and a lot, a heck of a lot nicer to sleep on. Now from personal experience, because this is my job to be able to tell you these things and also do these things so that I can properly tell you how it would be living here in the 18th century. I have slept on straw before, and I've slept in those beds before, and it is wildly uncomfortable. It is terrible. But sleeping in these, these beds here, in these rooms, is way more comfortable, only by a margin, but that's that small amount of comfort that you would love, especially when you camp for a living. So this is way more comfortable than what those guys are sleeping on. Now, over top of your bed tick, you would still have sheets. Now, the ticking material is this linen material. That's what we're referring to when we say ticking. And so that linen is a more robust linen, uh, but you don't want that up against your skin. You want something else a little bit lighter, so you have this nice, cleaner, lighter sort of linen that goes over top and acts as your bed sheets. And then you also have your blanket, which is obviously going to keep you warm uh, throughout those nice, cold winter nights. So even by today's standards of camping, this is still really nice stuff to have. They also get a pillow, which is probably going to be a goose down pillow, and also a bolster meant for propping up the head when they're sleeping at night as well. These are all things that are part of a modern bed set. However, most things that we don't have as part of our modern bed set will be something like a uh, bed curtain or bed fittings. Uh, the bed curtain here is meant to keep warm air on the inside of the bed whilst keeping cold air out or just being used as a bug net because for the warmer parts of the year, mosquitoes are everyone's problem. They're everyone's pest. No matter if you lived in the 18th century or you live now, everyone hates mosquitoes. So this also will help with some of that problem as well. Now each one of these beds, both of these beds are just a series of spots, pins, and hinges. It comes apart very easily. In fact, myself, I can put together and take apart one of these beds by myself within five minutes. So it's not really hard to put together. It's not really hard to take apart. It collapses in on itself and actually fits into this box right here underneath the bed. You take that box wherever you go, that gets put upon the luggage train. So if you have your bed and also your spare luggage with any extra clothing that you might have, that goes in the, uh, the luggage train if you have a, a baggage train following after the, the army. If not, then you might need to purchase your own pack animal in a cart just to lug all of your luggage around. And that was something that you did as well. Now, in, in addition to that, uh, our ensign, one of our low-ranking officers, we can tell that he's staying here because we have the standard of the British foot. His sole job is to learn how to be an officer and also carry the flag when they're out of campaign. However, here we also have two sets of arms, one of which is an espontoon and another of which is an officer's musket that we call a fusil or fusil. The reason why they're both here is because uh, things change once they make it here to North America. For instance, this is this, uh, specifically why they're both here. The Espontoon works well in open field warfare, but they're not going to be doing a lot of open field warfare here in North America because it's very heavily, uh, very underdeveloped land and you have very heavily wooded areas as well, which means carrying around a nice long pointy stick in the middle of a forest doesn't make a lot of sense. It'll get caught in the trees every five feet. And so they're actually ordered to leave this in their luggage. In fact, the whole way that they're fighting, which is that open field warfare, doesn't work here in North America. And they have to burn up in a completely new manual of arms to be able to deal with the terrain that they're in. And this happens within one to two winters. So imagine getting here and within the first couple of months, uh, as a soldier, you would, you would have been a nice, sharply drilled soldier, and now you've got to relearn a brand new manual because of the way that you're fighting here. That's what pretty much happens for these British soldiers once they make you here to North America. And so for the officers, Though this works as being able to find points of contact out on the battlefield, now they put these away and instead they are ordered to purchase officers' muskets. This gives them a means to be able to protect themselves, though they are not expected to load and fire this thing nearly as much as every other soldier. And even the soldiers themselves, they actually go from standing what we normally would call shoulder to shoulder with those nice strong united fronts. Now they'll actually be standing in what they call the order or the open order, which is about arms length to two arms length away from the person standing next to them. The purpose of this is to be able to spread out to, and cover more ground and to more easily navigate and very quickly navigate that broken terrain that we were just talking about. So warfare changes very rapidly uh, when we're talking about in terms uh, we're talking about specifically the sets of arms that they have. Now with these fusees, they do everything that every other musket does. It's got a lock, a stock, a barrel, it goes bang, that's pretty much what a musket does. And that's pretty much where the similarities end. Everything else thereafter, you have things like his name being put in the lock plate here, and even some etchings done on the trigger guard, and even some gilding put on the barrel. 
that's some extra things that he might want to add and he can pay for that out of his own pocket. In fact, everything that you see in here is paid for out of each one of these officers' own pocket. But they receive a large enough salary to where the government thinks that this is being sort of a common sense deal. Uh, I give you a large amount of money, you are now able to afford the things that you need to work with. And that's how pretty, uh, that pretty much works out, if that makes a lot, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, so, yeah. uh, do you have any questions so far? I know we covered a lot yeah. just now. No. No? Is all clear? Great. So now what we're going to do, we're just going to go into this room over here. All right, so normally when you walk into someone's house, you don't immediately go into the bedroom or they don't invite you to the bedroom. So I know we did this tour a little bit backwards, but that's where we started. So now, now that you've seen what their personal lives are like, when they're all together and they're gathering, they might be gathering in this room here. This room is called the long room because it is the longest room in the whole house. This is where they have all their offices meetings, they have all the large meals of the day, and so on and so forth. Now here in the center of the room, we have some really British sort of things. The first of which is going to be the portrait of King George II, who would be the ruling king at the time of the French and Indian War. You also have this fireplace back in here with the King's coat of arms, soon to be King George III's coat of arms, when King George II dies in 1760. That's when King George III, his grandson, will then take over the throne. Uh, they will you have a table set here uh, for basically leisurely things or even have a meeting. But this table over here has a few interesting things. Uh, for instance, one thing that it already has is this sort of porcelain ware. Imagine this plate here. This plate here can be one of two things. It can be China, which is set from China, which is really expensive. Or, eh, if you couldn't afford that, this might come from one of the, uh, uh, one of the, uh, wow, I'm getting things mixed up now, starting to. Uh, one of the, uh, I can't think of the word, one of the, uh, one of the Danish states, that's how I believe this is coming from. So now you have kind of like these mock-ups of this porcelain ware that you can eat off of. Well, that's influenced by China, and that's influenced by trade, and the trade is brought about by the British Empire, uh, which allows for things like this to appear here in North America. You even start to see things like sugar appear here in North America, which comes from the sugar islands. Or even you have fine wines, the one that they drink the most is Confidera, which is being sent here from Portugal or Spain. And so all of those things exist here in North America thanks to the might and the power of the British Empire. In fact, if you look at the color of this room, the color of this room is painted in a very specific color known as Prussian blue. Prussian blue is the only man-made pigment in the entire world uh, at this point in time. And the only place that you can get it is from London. And here it is, it appears here in this teeny little, tiny little town of Trenton of 900 people uh, here in the colonies at this point in time which gives us a very large scope of British influence. In fact, uh, let's actually take a step outside for a minute. Yep. So even if you were to compare even the exterior of the building here, this building here is very much a British sort of structure where you have this building on this left side here uh, being a very uh, New Jersey sort of structure or a very colony sort of structure, a very American sort of structure. In fact, this is a Quaker home that's been copied and painted all the way around. But this is a British house. That's a military structure. This is someone's private home. And so you start to see these, these very large differences in very uh, common uh, uh, British influences as well, just to kind of reinforce the uh, social class structure that we were talking about before, and also kind of see how much British influence there is here in the colonies. In fact, they love being part of the British Empire. In fact, that's why they don't want to be French. The French have a totalitarianistic style of government, which means they have an absolute monarchy. Uh, there's one person running the whole show. At least being part of the British Empire, everybody has inherent rights. And that's one thing that they were constantly going to fight over, especially come the close of the French War in 1763. Uh, by that time, then this, this is when you start to have all these very large acts and taxes that start to come uh, become placed upon uh, the British Empire, or rather the uh, colonies here, directly for the very first time in over 200 years of these people living here. This will ultimately end with uh, or start with the Boston Massacre and end with April 19th of 1775, which would be the shock heard around the world, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. Now, after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, and even the Battle of Bunker Hill, 
you have a couple of things that will happen here specifically at this building. For instance, this place will become a recruiting post in about November of 1775 for the second New Jersey Regiment. They will also house British prisoners of war, ironically enough, inside the officer's house, which will be officers being kept in prisoners of war. And obviously there is a conflict of interest between the 2nd New Jersey Regiment here and the officers that stand for the thing that they're fighting against. And so they move the recruiting post to somewhere else into the town of Trenton. However, there are going to be many different people that are going to be kept as prisoners of war throughout the officer's house. And now, as far as the rest of the building, they'll be moved out of here at some point. Uh, but then you'll start to get into the latter part of the year. Now, 1776, when we think about that, we think about that as being this really great year. Most people uh, recall one major thing, which would be the Declaration right. of Independence on 4th of July. And the Declaration of Independence might be one of the only great things that actually came out of 1776. Because throughout that year, every single major battle would actually be lost by the Continental Line. Now by this point, this is when you actually have the difference between them defending the British liberties in 1775 and actually becoming a brand new country in 1776. And so since the narrative has changed, the way that they need to raise up and actually talk to get people uh, talk about this actually has to change as well. And it didn't work, not very well. Because the ideals of independence, well, it only has as much value as you can give to it. And imagine uh, hungry, broke soldiers rallying under an idea that seems to not be working very well. They didn't like this too much. And come the end of 1776, there's only about three to 5,000 soldiers of the original 25,000 to 30,000 soldiers that started out the year. And the war was in jeopardy of being over by this point in time. Now, if it wasn't for the actions that take place here, uh, come the first and second Battle of Trenton, and even the Battle of Princeton, which we call the 10th Crucial Days Campaign, all of this would be moot, and pretty much the rest of the history that you would learn here would stop at this point because there's nothing left to talk about. But because of the three victories that take place here, this allows for many other things actually to, uh, to, to come about, especially here in this particular building. Because one other major thing that this building serves as is a military hospital. 90% of the uh, the army in 1776 would die from disease and so one of the few things that will happen after the battles of Trenton and Princeton uh, is that Washington will change some, some things. The first thing he does is he changes enlistment times. Enlistment times will be uh, which were used which used to be nine to twelve months they will now change to three years of the duration of the war whichever was longer to allow for a, a larger amount of army or a larger army over a longer period of time. He also says that every single new recruit that comes into the Continental Line now needs to be inoculated for the smallpox disease. So come February 1777, this building will now become an, a smallpox inoculation hospital under the direction of Dr. Bodo Otto to deal with those things. Now before we move on, I've kind of just skipped through about 20 years worth of history. So I'm gonna pause there and ask if you have any questions about anything. Do you need any clarifications? Is there anything you're interested in? No, no, I'm pretty good, man. Now, in terms of the 10 Crucial Days campaign with the Battles of Triton and Princeton, we have an entire gallery dedicated to that. That's why I very briefly touched upon that. And that goes into in-depth in detail about all of those things, all right? So okay. I'll point you to the, to the gallery if you're interested in learning more about that. However, yeah, if you follow okay. me, we're actually going to go into that room here and learn a little bit more about the medical history of this building as it serves as a hospital. Okay. be operating out. Dr. Otto is a physician that is going to be sent here by the Continental Congress uh, to do, perform smallpox inoculations. Now inoculations are very different from vaccinations simply because of the fact that vaccinations would not be discovered until 1790 and we're talking about 1776 uh, rather 1777. And so what they're dealing with is inoculations which is giving someone the smallpox with the hopes that they live from it. However, if they do this in a very particular sort of way, this can actually be very successful. In fact, most inoculations are about 80 to 85% successful throughout the 18th century. And so how do they achieve this? Well, first, find someone who knows what they're doing. He went to a university, pretty much the equivalent of going to like Princeton University Medical School. Because most other physicians of the 18th century or any sort of person working in medicine would be someone like an apothecary or even your dentist who did the occasional tooth pulling and bloodletting as well. You don't want that type of person doing this type of work for the thousands of soldiers that you need to be treated. And so, someone who knows what you're doing is a really great thing. 
Now his job was to go into the town and find someone with the smallpox disease that was at the very beginning stages. And typically when someone got the pox, they got the smallpox from head to toe, which would be these pus-filled boils that would actually start to grow together, causing massive amounts of inflammation, which can occur like this, or they can go even more extreme, and sometimes they can occur like this. Now, this is obviously worse than this, and he would love to find someone at the beginning stages of what they would call the stink pox. And so maybe they have one or two in the face, another two or three in the arm, maybe another four or five down the leg, even more scarce than that. And then thereafter, what they would do is they would take a small lancet and lance open one of those boils just to thoroughly check, just because someone looks like they're at the beginning stages doesn't actually mean that they are. And so they would check the fluid that would come out, and the fluid should be a clear, odorless liquid with the consistency of honey. If it was milky or foul-smelling in any way, shape, or form, it would be too far along. So once they found the ideal sort of uh, mixture or ideal sort of fluid, they would gather in a vial, and it should look something like this. Now once they've gathered that in that vial, now they can actually bring that back here and start inoculating soldiers. But they're not immediately going to start giving this to people. For instance, I've only just met, met you a few minutes ago. I know nothing about your personal medical history. And so for you to walk in here and for me to just give you the smallpox blindly would be a very reckless thing to do. And so what they would do is they would first treat any ailments that a person might have by doing a series of different purgings or preliminary purgings. Now some of these might need to be done, some of them might not need to be done. So I'm going to tell you about all of them, but most of them probably wouldn't apply depending on what uh, each case would actually be. For instance, bloodlettings. That's a very common thing of the 18th century, bleedings. That's as simple as a bowl and a knife most times, uh, or sometimes even using leeches, which would tend to suck between two to four ounces of blood on their own, which need, means you need about five leeches to properly bleed someone. Now after doing bloodlettings, you could do um, the cleansing of yellow bile inside of the body, even black bile as well, by doing a vomiting, which involves taking a cup like this one here, filling it with milk and vinegar, and telling that person to drink it. That will then uh, expel any nasty uh, phlegm, mucus, and uh, whatever other things inside of the body as well. And then sometimes you can get a little creative. Uh, most times you can use the clister with salt water, but for a specific parasite, sometimes you would need to use tobacco smoke to get rid of those parasites. This clister does not go where you spit, it goes where you sit. And so this would be placed up the butt, and then you sp uh, blow some of the smoke there, and some of the parasites, or most of the parasites, would come running out of the body. This actually did work very well. Yeah, I know where they got, got that saying. <laughs> Want to smoke up your butt? <laughs> so that's pretty much where, uh, how they could deal with that, and there's many other things that they could do, but those are some of the things. Some of them kind of unorthodox like the clister, but this is what they knew at that point in time. And for the most part, some of that stuff did work, some of it didn't. Now, after they cleanse the body of all foulness, uh, for instance, like a loose tooth, that's to prevent anything bad from happening or for the smallpox to mix with anything in the body which would cause any sort of fatality. And so once they got rid of all that, then they could introduce the pox into the body. The most popular way that people know of giving someone the smallpox is the quill method where you take a, some, something similar to a whiting quill and make a couple scratches on the skin and they would get it that way. In military context, this doesn't work very, uh, very well because sometimes you don't know if someone uh, takes to the pox within the first seven days. And so if you wait those seven days and they don't take to the pox, well now you've just wasted seven days. This whole process from start to finish is about 14 to 21 days. So imagine you've pretty much taken a quarter of your time and wasted it because now you need to start over. And so a more invasive method will be developed. Uh, using some other form of lancet. So we've already looked at one lancet. This particular lancet is what we call a fleen. Uh, this is just a different set of different size sort of blades. So you can take the fleen and you can make a small incision, most likely going to be up on the upper arm, underneath the arm, or behind the knee in most places where superficial scarring uh, would occur and no one would ever be able to see it uh, because of 18th century clothing. I'm actually wearing the bare minimum of what's acceptable to go outside and at least since I'm living here inside the barracks. So, after they've uh, rubbed the pox inside of those cuts, the pox is for sure living inside of that body. But then you need to make sure no one spreads it by accident. So they would take a large majority of the clothes away from them, leaving them with their undergarments, which would be their shirt and stockings. That's their 18th century underwear. Uh, shirt comes from here, goes all the way down to about here. Stockings come all the way up to about here. So you're still covered from neck to toe, but then be placed into one of the other rooms here as an act of quarantine, where there might be four or five other people going through the same exact thing. Which means within the first few days, everyone would have a slight upset stomach, but then thereafter, day seven will come around, and the first pustule will appear at the side of the inoculation. 
That pus will start to grow in size with inflammation. A few auxiliary pustules might form around it, and even some might stray down towards the lower part of the arm. But they will not spread all over the body, much like the person they had taken it from. That's the one advantage of having the smallpox in terms of an inoculation. Next thing that will happen is flu-like symptoms will occur. So running nose fever, headache, aches, coughing, all that, all the nine yards of having the flu. Those symptoms will then subside. The pox will then start to go down. The swelling will go down. The inflammation will go away. And eventually those scabs uh, or those pustules will turn to scabs. And then like any child ever across America, they tell them not to pick up the scabs because they are actually still contagious. They can still spread the disease and it would not be allowed to leave the barracks until the scabs fall off of the body. Uh, and as a further precaution, they will bring them back here, take the rest of their clothing, which is your shirt and stockings, boil that in boiling hot water, then give them all of their clothes back. That's to get rid of anything else that could be festering in their clothes. And then they would be deemed fit for service. Now, as I mentioned, for the whole of the 18th century, this is about 80 to 85% successful. But in particular, dealing with this particular hospital under Dr. Bodo Otto, he is 100% successful making sure that people survive the disease. Now, though we did talk about this here, this is not the first place that we hear about inoculations. Inoculations are being done all over the world, and this is the first mass inoculation that is happening here in the Western Hemisphere. So technically, you could credit Washington with doing the first mass inoculation in the Western Hemisphere. But they actually developed this from parts of Asia that were already doing this, parts of Africa that were already doing this, parts of India that were already doing this, and so on. So this is something that they already knew about, but it had become more acceptable by the time we make it to the 1770s. Now, thereafter, the building will be used as a hospital of sorts all the way up to the end of the war, and the war will come to a close in 1783. And thus, by the late 1780s, early 1790s, Front Street will be extended through the middle of the barracks here, uh, spanning from just on the other side of this window here on the left side of you, all the way down through this door to that threshold. So this entire length of this, uh, this building here was actually turned into an extension of Front Street called West Front Street. Now behind us we have the State Capitol building. And they rebuilt it? Yep, yeah. they did. Uh, now behind us we have the State Capitol building which will be completed by October of 1792. Now once that's completed, well now you have the new heart of Trenton. So remember before we mentioned that Trenton was two miles in that direction, well now we're in the heart of Trenton. Now this building will sit here and will constantly adapt to the town, which is a testament as to why this building still remains. For instance, the officer's house will be sold off in public auction. It will be turned into a private residence and even a small charter school for a period of time. The rest of the north half of the building will be turned into an apartment building with many other apartment buildings lining down the West Front Street. You have the south half of the building being turned into a home for single women and widows and even maybe a small charter school for a period of time itself as well. But then it starts to fall into a minor state of dilapidation, but no worries. By 1899, you're going to have the uh, Old Barracks Association that is going to be founded. By 1902, they would have done so much fundraising in and around the town of Trenton that they raised enough money to purchase the south half of the building. By 1903, they opened up as a museum for the very first time. And that's the first iteration of the Old Barracks Museum under the Old Barracks Association. But then there will be two major restorations. Uh, now, this is only after you have a deal that is made with them about 10 years later after they opened up the first version of the Old Barracks Museum, in which the state of New Jersey will approach them and say, if you sell your half of the building, which is that side, uh, we will purchase the north half of the building, which is this side over here, and they will also pay for the restoration of the middle portion of the building, whilst also appropriating funds for them to start their budget every single year. They agree to these times. And so, 1915, construction begins on this new middle section of the building. By 1917, construction will end. Now, throughout uh, 1917 and throughout the rest of the World War I, this building would actually serve as the headquarters for the American Red Cross and then be turned back over to the Old Barracks Association to be used as a museum. In the 1980s, they do a restoration which brings a more military sort of light uh, to the building uh, in more of a colonial revival feel. But then, by the 1990s, uh, in uh, conjunction with Hunter Research, which is right up the road from here, they get really deep down into the military history of this building and uh, with the help of some of the records left behind, they're able to put the building back together in the closest, most accurate uh, representation of this building as we would have seen it in 1758-1759. Now, the building here is 70 to 75 percent of the original foundation, most of which exists on the south half of the building. So if you've already walked through our gift shop and even walked through this gallery here or the gallery in the back, you've already walked on 260-year-old foundation, which is still standing strong. Um, and 
a lot of that deal that was made with the state of New Jersey is still upheld. And the other part of that was uh, uh, being able to do our own fundraising throughout the year. And so the admission that you paid earlier, that is part of our fundraising to be able to keep the doors open for people like yourself to be able to come here and visit the old barracks. And that's how we stay open. So thank you for coming here to visit us. Uh, we, I hope that you enjoyed your tour. Um, and there's plenty more for you to see. There's a gallery upstairs that talks about New Jersey's involvement in the French Union War that I really encourage you to take a look at. And if nothing else, go take a look at the pine tree flag that we have, which is said to be the first military flag ever flown here in North America. We're the only museum that has one on display in all of North America. So feel free to go take a look at that. We also have the gallery here, which talks about the last hundred years of barracks history. And it notes some of the restoration process that I was mentioning earlier and also the gallery in the back uh, through the gift shop which talks about the 10 crucial days campaign as I mentioned before that talks about the battles of Trenton and Princeton there's also a film in there that is about 20 to 25 minutes long so if you have that sort of time feel free to take a look at that as well but you can still take a look around and uh, see all the documentation that we dug up to be able to tell the story properly of those battles all right okay so okay. I hope you enjoyed yourself cool. I got one good question for you yes how do you remember all that? <laughs> I like it a lot. That's how I remember it all. And I, I love what I do. So, you know, they say when, when you like what you do, you don't really work a day in your life. I really like what I do. That's cool. All right? All right. Thank so, you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. How do I move upstairs? All right. So if you come